So, oh, hello and welcome to this second class in my course in integration theory. I hope you're as excited as I am to be here. I've armed myself with um, a fair amount of coffee. Recommend you do the same. So, um, things are going to get a bit heavy now. But you know what to say when the going gets rough, the rough gets going. So, um, what we're aiming for now is, is actually not a tall order at all. We want, I mean, where did this all start? We wanted to measure the size of sets. Okay, and we have established so far with this Banach-Tarski paradox that we won't be able to measure the size of any given set. And if you think of the Riemann integral, the only set we actually know the length of, let's call uh, lambda, the length of something. So if we have an integral from A to B, we know that the length is B minus A. So um, this is what we want. We want a measure on, well, so far we only know one sigma algebra, right? It's the border one. So recap, we have open sets, we have closed sets. Uh, those are like the basic sets that you work with as a mathematician. So we need to include them. And then we prove that there is always the smallest unique sigma algebra that includes whatever collection you start out with. So using either the closed or the open ones doesn't matter, but uh, those sets generate a sigma algebra called the Brown sigma algebra. That's the smallest one we can work with, you know, if we want all the decent sets to be inside. And now we just want some function on those sets such that when you stick in an interval, you get the length of the interval. Such a measure exists and it's called a Lebesgue measure, but uh, <laughs> it's damn hard to get there. So, so it's a bit uh, funny. So in different textbooks, you find different ways. There are basically two ways that I've seen of getting to, to this measure. So one goes through functional analysis and the other one goes through like just uh, what we're going to do here, just the very details of the construction, making a construction by hand, so to speak. Now, in measure theory, nothing is really by hand. It's all kind of abstract still, but, but it doesn't involve other branches, okay? So before I tell you what we are going to do, this is just like for you to orient yourself, because if you've seen other books like Rudin's, for example, they do the functional analysis route to defining measures. I believe I haven't checked lately, but I believe that's the case. So anyways, so there are two alternatives here. Alternative one, which we're not going to do just for curiosity. Right, so this approach, alternative one, is based on functional analysis. So. Once we have measures, right now we just have Riemann integration, right? So what we can define is functionals on, on, on sets of functions. So consider all functions that are continuous with compact support. Now take such a function f and send it into the Riemann integral. Yeah, this exists because it has compact support, right? So there's no generalized integral or anything like that. And gives you a number in R. And like such, it creates a linear functional that we can call L. Now, there's an, a theorem which says basically that any time you have a linear functional on a space like this, uh, it's given by integration against the measure. It's called the Reese representation theory. So if you prove that independently of all the measure theory, you can just say, well, this is a linear functional on this space. So there must be something we're going to call a measure. Uh, defined implicitly by this functional. All right, so I don't like this approach particularly because it doesn't give you a feeling for what measures really are. Uh, so in our approach, we're gonna make like a more hands-on construction of measures. And then this theorem here, the Reed's representation theorem will be a consequence. So it's in chapter six or seven of Cole's book. Um, okay, so that was functional analysis. Now let's do measure theory. Okay, so what we're after is something we're going to call lambda, 
which is uh, then a function on B of R, the Borel sigma algebra, which assigns length, whatever that means. An interval should be given uh, B minus A. That's the only thing we want, and some consistency rules. Okay, this is a small order, but uh, the road to get there is long. So we cannot do this just um, like that. So what we're going to do instead is introduce another object. So the road here path goes through something called outer measures. So we're going to start uh, and construct something called lambda star. And lambda star is going to act on the power set of R we're going to construct something we call an outer measure on the power set um, such that it assigns length to intervals now as argued previously this will lead into some problems so we're going to see that in the course of events why this lambda star is actually not a good um, it doesn't behave like a measure let's say that so we have this like Barnard Tarski style counterexamples uh, or sets that don't behave the way we want them to so what we're going to do once we have our outer measure which uh, behaves like this the way we want on intervals we're going to throw away all the sets that don't behave nicely okay so once we have our outer measures this is going to lead us to a sigma algebra so we're going to define some sigma algebra of sets that let's call it behave well now here comes another problem with this approach is that unfortunately the sets that behave well are not going to be the Borel sets but it's going to be something bigger uh, so let's call this m and then we'll write here a lambda star signifying that it comes from the outer measure lambda star Note now that I used the notation as in Kohn's book, so there's no equality guy there, which means strictly smaller. This is not equal to that, which is not equal to that. So there is a sequence of subsets here. So that is the grand master plan for this lecture and the next. Now, okay, measure theory or doing the Lebesgue integral, the second objective. I suppose, uh, apart from just improving the Riemann integral, is that we want to be able to integrate in any possible set X, you know, not just Rn or simple, well familiar objects like that. So we're not going to do this whole thing with outer measure just for the Lebesgue measure, although that's the primary uh, focus. We're going to do this in full generality. Okay. So the general path will be. We start with some space X, and then we construct an outer measure on the power set of X. And the outer measure is then going to give rise to a sigma algebra, so a subset of the power set of X uh, that we're going to call MU star. So this we have to do in the full generality first. And once we're done with that, we're going to go replace X with the real line and see that this really gives us um, a measure like, like what we want here, which we call the living measure.
what will make measure come from applying this process first to something we're going to call lambda star and from lambda star we get lambda the Lebesgue measure so this is the outer measure this is the Lebesgue measure so the star always signifies outer measure now enough talking what means outer measure definition Okay, so a function mu star on the power set of x, x is any set, to the positive real numbers, including infinity and zero. So this uh, square bracket here means also including infinity. We allow infinity, the measure of something can be infinite. Okay, so this is an outer measure. If three conditions are fulfilled, the first one is the same as, no, it's not exactly the same. Um, yeah, it's the same as for a measure. So the measure or outer measure of an empty set should be zero. Two, so here we're collecting things which are easier to satisfy. The, so the, the addition, you know, for a measure, here yeah, I would write now that the measure of an infinite union of disjoint set is the same as summing them up, infinite sum. That is hard to get to. So let's uh, opt for something uh, softer, yeah? So at least one thing you can expect from a measure is that if you have a smaller set and a bigger set, like in the sense that the first one is included in the latter, then the latter should have a bigger measure, right? So A, subset B implies that mu star of A is less than or equal to mu star of B. And now something very close to the, the summation identity, but not exactly. If this was a measure, we would have identity here. And we would require that these guys are disjoint. Now, here we have inequality. So the measure of the infinite union of a bunch of sets should be smaller than just summing up the measure of each set, or outer measure, I should say. And here, since we have this inequality, it makes really no sense to demand that they have to be disjoint, because if they're not disjoint, it's not going to affect the size of the left-hand side, but it's just going to make the right-hand side bigger. So that's just um, superfluous. Now, in the book, they have several uh, stupid examples of um, outer measures because it's very hard to construct uh, any, you know, real, so to speak, examples of this. So, except one, and that is the Lebesgue outer measure, which in itself um it's, it's kind of a, 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 a bit of a journey to walk to figure out that it is even an outer measure let's start with the definition okay so what i wrote here is more complicated than it looks. So given a set A, any set A subset of R, we form this C of A, which is the collection of all intervals or sequences or sets of intervals which combined cover A. So basically, okay, so here C A is a collection which consists of collections of intervals from aj to bj such that this collection is such that if you take the infinite union of these intervals 
you get something that covers your original set A. So if A is somewhere here uh, with some, uh, it's impossible to paint uh, really, but maybe a bit like this, yeah? So then I could pick, you know, A1, B1, that would be my first interval. Uh, and then I put here A2, B2, the second interval like that, in your case, third interval, and so on. So here it's we're in a situation where it's kind of uh, simple to construct. Well, I mean, I'm just putting one interval next to each other, but of course, we can have situations that, okay, so here is the third one, but then maybe the fourth one. It's a smaller one sitting here, so you, you have a, you can have a very complicated layout of these intervals in the end. We're going to see that shortly when we're going to prove that the rational numbers have zero living outer measure. Um, okay, but what is now the outer measure? Well, if I cover this set A with intervals, then the combined length of those intervals should be just summing up their length, right? So that number has to be bigger than whatever is the measure of A. So what is that number? We have then sum uh, J goes from one to infinity, BJ minus AJ. For any covering in CA, we form this number, and then we say, well, the measure or outer measure of this guy must be smaller than this. So, if I take an infimum over all possible coverings like this, I can define that as the Lebesgue outer measure of A. So, this is Technically a bit hard, but a very natural definition, yeah? The only thing we know how to assign length is intervals. We take an arbitrary set, cover it with intervals, sum up the length of those intervals, and try to make that as snug as possible, meaning at the end of the day, for all possibilities like this, you have uncountably many possibilities of doing that, take an infimum. Of course, in practice, this is not something you could ever compute, but compute them, we leave aside, yeah, that comes later. For now, we're just worried about existence, like in theology. Okay, so that is the Lebesgue outer measure. Let me actually flip the order here. And before I prove that this is an outer measure, let us do an example and see that the rational numbers have measure zero. Outer measure zero. So lambda star of the rational numbers equal to zero. Um, okay, proof. It starts out with this observation that the rational numbers are countable. Actually, how do we prove that? Uh, I think it's in the appendix, appendix six, but you can paint it with, with a picture. So any rational number you can write as a quotient of two natural numbers, right? So let's just go for the positive rational ones. Then we can put all integers here on an axis n. And here we put another axis n, and then we think of any rational number as n divided by n. Okay. Then, if you want to count all such possibilities, you just go like a tour here. So you can enumerate them like this. And if you go through this, like tuck, 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 up to infinity, you get all possible positive rational numbers. So that's how we do that. But okay, appendix six in the book, as I said, I, I believe. Um, otherwise you have to find it yourself if it's not appendix six. 
we start with this. Okay, how can we now cover all rational points with sets? You know, we, we don't want we want these sums to be finite, yeah. So these sets have to be smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, let me make a small box here. So technically, I mean, it, it will be very hard to imagine this because here's the Q1. Okay, now I have to put some some interval on, around it, and then I have Q2, and I put another interval there. But I mean, these rational numbers are dense. Yeah, there's no gaps whatsoever. So this is somehow counterintuitive. We're, we're aiming for a finite number here. But intuitively, I would say that we will get an infinite number all the time. Because if you want to cover something which is dense on the real line with open intervals, then you kind of have to cover the whole real line, right? Apparently not. And it's actually very, very easy to see or construct mathematically that uh, that you do an example that shows that you do not need to cover the whole line, but to visualize it, that's a different issue. So pick epsilon bigger than zero. This is the most common phrase of the entire course. So get used to it. This is now just any number. And then we define I J to be equal to qj minus epsilon divided by 2 to the power of j and qj plus epsilon divided by 2 to the power of j. Okay, so now this is an open interval with qj in the middle. The length is epsilon divided by 2j times the 2. Uh, okay, so that's an interval. Just like the a, so this is your aj, that's your bj if you want. And now the sum j goes from one to infinity. Oh, oh, okay. This is your aj, that is your bj, then your bj minus aj. The qj here doesn't matter, so now we just get the length. So now we get an infinite geometric series, and we know that this is, I mean, the epsilon can go on the outside. This starts with um, one, a half, plus a quarter, blah, blah. So the sum, I mean, there's a formula for what this is, and this is two times epsilon. Okay, so, you know, I'll write it here. It's one or one minus one half, so that's two. That's where I got this number two from. Um, yeah. So now this is an example of one of these uh, infinite sums for a covering of the rational numbers. Well, now I'm going to take an infimum here. Well, since epsilon is arbitrary, the infimum is going to be zero. No, actually, instead of sending it up, I'm going to erase that part and do the proof that Lebesgue outer measure is an outer measure while we can look at this. So let me do some erasing and continue. Okay, so to save space, I'm going to write here proposition lambda star is an outer measure okay so if you think about it a bit oh no i erased the definition what <laughs> there's no good way either you erase this or you erase that okay so the definition that just disappeared of the outer measure okay just like we saw that the rational numbers have zero measure, clearly the void set is going to have zero measure. You're taking femum of nothing and get zero. Okay, that's fine. Now, if I have a covering of B of intervals with a certain length, that's also a covering of A. 
right? So in the infimum that you take for A, you have all possibilities that exist for the infimum of B. Therefore, the infimum corresponding to A must be smaller than or equal to the infimum for B. This is almost immediate. Here, it's getting difficult. So, so here we go again. Pick epsilon bigger than zero. So the way to prove an inequality going this way will be to show that this is less than this plus some epsilon. And then you say epsilon is arbitrary, boom, I can throw it away. That's a very common argument here in this course. It's impossible to work here. <sighs> All right, so for each set AK, I have the collection of open intervals that covers my AK. It's called CAK. So an element here is a collection of intervals that I know will cover my AK. All right. ST. I use ST for such that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to write that out all the time. So, to be overly clear again, so this is just restating what CAK means. So, this has to be a subset of that infinite union. But here comes the additional condition and Okay, just to get your minds around how these proofs works, this is what we know, yeah? Because the definition of this lambda star is you take an infimum here, so for any fixed choice of sets like this, we have inequality like that. In this proof, or in this statement, we want the inequality to go the other way around. Oh, yeah, so with lambda star, right? We want to say that this is bigger than that, but we can't do that. But what you can always do then is add something here, and then you flip the inequality around. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a plus one over, no. Okay. So I add an epsilon divided by two to the power of k. Two to the power of k here is just there, just like we saw for the rational numbers that I want to, at some point I'm going to sum up over k. I want that to be a finite sum that, that scales like epsilon. So here it is kind of arbitrary, two to the power of k. It could have been three to the power of k or whatever. But I add something here to my, my lambda star. And that is the lambda star is the infimum of guys like this. Of course, I can then pick, since I added something, I can pick one guy here of, of this type to the right so that the inequality goes the other way. Make sure you understand this part of the argument before we go on. Because from here on, it's not that hard. So, I had the wrong symbol here, so I have to retract a bit. Okay, so now um, let me get go through this argument that I wrote down here calmly. So now I'm just gonna this infinite union of the eight case, I'm just gonna call it A. That's not really necessary, but okay, now I did. Then each AK is a union of countably many uh, intervals. So here I have a double countable union, but just like we saw with the rational numbers in the previous example, if you take countably many objects that each object is countably many, it's again countably many. Just like we saw like this, you could go like this through the n squared natural numbers. Uh, 
the product of the national Cartesian product of the natural numbers. Anyways, so this by itself is a countable set of intervals that we can reorder. Now I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to work with it as it is. So instead of reordering them, I'm just saying that a j k to b j k for j and k going from one to infinity is in C of A, meaning that this is a countable set of intervals that cover A, okay? By definition of lambda star, this means that A, lambda star of A, which is the infimum of all such, um, you know, the sum of the lengths is smaller than that. So I have less than or equal to, and then here a double sum. Now here we're actually, getting a bit into basic questions about the real number line. So if I were to rearrange this into one sequence, so I count them one, two, three, four, five, is the corresponding sum here independent of how I count them, in which way I enumerate them? And is it equal to this double sum? The answer is yes, because these are positive numbers. Otherwise there is this Riemann rearrangement um, theory, which basically says that, if you allow signs here, then under some uh, if the absolute sum is infinite, then you can rearrange here so that you get any kind of sum. But basically for positive numbers, all we can do is we define the infinite sum as just the infimum of all possible finite sums of this type. And then you prove that the double sum is that infimum. So we, we, we just take this fact from the real number line and, and use it in this course. Uh, but basically this kind of like, when can I swap order of summation? This is what we are actually gonna get to. I mean, summation is a basic form of integrating. So this is, if you want Tonelli's theory for integrals that we're gonna do later, or yeah, in general, these kind of questions are dealt with, uh, with uh, Fubini's theory is the most famous one. Then you allow signs of Tonelli's when you just have positive ones. So that's, that's in chapter five of the book. But like I said, this is just post doubly indexed sum of positive numbers. We take it as a fact that it doesn't matter how we sum them up, you always get the same number. So I can put this sum with the J on the inside, the sum with the K on the outside. And then I see, okay, but these guys, when I hold K fixed, it's a covering, you know, of my AK right here. So the outer measure of AK is smaller than that. I don't want smaller than, I want bigger than, but that's why, you know, we, we did this trick here. So thanks to the epsilon divided by 2K, I can have my inequality going the right way and replace this, the inner sum, with lambda star AK divided by plus this a small gap. And apparently this K ended up in the wrong place. Okay, now here again, uh, well, here's an infinite sum. I can sum this up separately and that up separately. So it's again, this uh, reordering of sums that we are allowed to do with positive numbers. So the first sum I'm doing nothing with it. And the second sum, well, epsilon doesn't change and one over two to the power of K. Now we're starting, there's not K minus one. So the infinite sum of that is gonna be equal to one. So all in all, I just get an epsilon here in the end. So what did I want? I wanted to show that this, which corresponds to this guy is less than this. And that's what I have. It's just that I have a plus epsilon. Well, epsilon was arbitrary, so I can throw it away. Ta -da. Yeah. So this is a very typical proof in, in, in this course. Um, yeah, requires some thinking to get your mind around it. So please, uh, you know, take a break and make sure you, you understood this argument. Try to do it yourself with a pen and paper, maybe just turn it off and uh, recapitulate the key steps um, because if you do that now it will help you later because we will see similar arguments over and over again. Okay, so that was uh, Lebesgue outer measure for the real line. Now, 
if you are in R2, we can do the same type of construction. So in R2, uh, lambda star also exists. And what we do is I'm just going to paint the picture, right? So um, if we have some sort of set, I can always cover it with uh, some rectangles, right? Rectangles, I know what is the size, so the intuitive meaning of size, we just multiply the side lengths. So if I have a bunch of rectangles covering my original set, I can sum up their area, and then I take the infimum over all possible coverings with rectangles. If you're in three dimensions, you do the same with cubes or boxes, whatever it's called in three dimensions corresponding of a rectangle. Um, yeah, so the construction is exactly the same in all of these cases. Now, so we have our outer measure, the leg outer measure, and we wanted to give the size of sets. So what's the problem now with using it on the power set? Well, the problem is that we can construct sets, let me call them A and B. So there exists A and B, subsets of the interval from zero to one. We're gonna look at this construction later. I'm just telling you about it now. Such that A union B is equal to the interval from zero to one. But the Lebesgue measure of A Plus the Lebesgue measure of B strictly bigger than one. Okay. okay. They also have to be disjoint. But here's the point that if you have two sets where disjoint and together make up zero to one, the total measure, if this is supposed to be follow any intuitive computational rules, then the, the measure of each one, if you sum that up, it should be equal to one, because that's the length of zero to one. But you can construct them so that you get a number bigger than one. So it means that, okay, the Lebesgue outer measure, it exists on the power set. It's just that it doesn't behave like a measure the way we want it to behave. So what we need to do now is we want to choose given any outer measure, which always exists on the power set of X or R or Rn, whatever it is. Given an outer measure, we want to construct a subset of uh, the power set of, of sets that are well behaved, so to speak. Yeah, so that's the objective. And as I've already shown you, that's going to give us a sigma algebra, which unfortunately, in the case of the real line, is not the Borel sigma algebra, it's something else. It's a bigger one. So So we have outer measures. How do we define sets which behave nicely? Well, we have to come up with some, some, some criterion that they should satisfy. This criterion here, what I'm gonna give you is, I haven't, in the 15 or so years I've been teaching this course, I have never figured out what's the intuition behind this one. This is something, you know, Lebesgue, he had got his name attached to this theory. He sat down, he thought hard, he came up with this. It's just, yeah. Hats off to Lebesgue. Here's what it is. So, Right, so as I said, this definition, there's no intuition for it. We're gonna call the set B, mu star measurable if, and now it's a condition involving another set A. And A can be, so this is for all A. <laughs> it looks a bit funny because it's an A upside down. It's not so funny actually. This is mathematics, you have to <laughs> pick the small grains you find. Okay, 
Uh, so for any subset A of X, we have this identity. What does the identity say? Well, it says that the outer measure of A, which we know what it is, is equal to the sum of, if you intersect with B and then you intersect with the complement of B. So precisely, I mean, here we wanted this one plus this one to be equal to, uh, you know, one or less than what? Yeah, so we want this one plus this one to be equal to one. Yeah, but it, that doesn't happen for these sets. So basically, what the requirement here is like, even if A is like really complicated, stupid, B should be nice enough that it can cut it up into two pieces such that this sort of intuitive summation formula holds. Um, so yeah, it's not a condition on A, it's a condition on B. That's the property of like dividing things in two parts um, such that addition works the way uh, you intuitively want it to. So in a way, this, this requires B to be nice. For example, if, if B, An example here, if X is the real line and the set B could be the interval from minus infinity up to some point, including that point, then the complement is everything beyond that point, right? So we have the real line here, here's the point B. And the set A can be like all over the place, yeah? But A intersect this part, that's well, gonna be everything here. And A intersect the other part, it's gonna be everything there. You can kind of imagine that the way we constructed the Lebesgue outer measure, just like cutting it up in one left piece and one right piece, that's a nice enough operation that it's not going to affect, you know, the outer measure what for what's going on here and the outer measure what's going on there. If you add that up, you're just going to get the outer measure. Um, indeed, we're going to prove that in just a little while. All right, so one note before we get into more technical proofs, the left hand side LHS of this, it's always smaller than the right hand side or smaller than or equal to, that's an obvious thing, more or less obvious, that's always true by three. So almost three, he says this, right, that the outer measure of an infinite union is less than the sum. Here we have the same situation. Uh, so this is the union, A here is the union of this one and that one, okay? But we don't have infinitely many, we just have two. But just like in my previous class, you can think here that the sets beyond the first two are just empty. And then you use number one, which says that that has measure zero. So then you always have, finite counterpart of this is always true as well. So this is less than that. That's immediate from the definition of outer measure, so to speak. It's going the other way, which is hard. Okay, so here comes the first really difficult theorem in the book. Basically saying that, um, okay, I'll write it up. All right, so if mu star is an outer measure on some set X, we can denote by M mu star, the set of all measurable sets according to that identity, which we discussed just now. Then A M mu star is a sigma algebra. And two, you, okay. All right, so this notation starts to get a bit <laughs> complicated. Mu, 
And now yes. define that to be mu star, this dash big line here means restricted to m mu star. All right, so, you know, if you have a function f, you can always take some subset here, a, and then think of f only on that subset. And this we we'll call it f restricted to a. So it's the same here. Mu star takes in any measure in the power set. Sorry, not that guy. Takes in any measure in the power set. But we can restrict that and say, okay, I'm only going to allow sets from this sigma algebra. And then now it's, it's kind of the same thing, but it's, it's, it's acts only on a certain sets. So it deserves its own notation, just as if I would call this G instead of F, because F is kind of absurd for the big thing. So the restricted thing has its new name. So mu. Okay, so first part says this collection of sets is a sigma algebra. Second part, if we restrict to that, then we get a measure. The second part is very easy once we have established the first part. But establishing the first part, that is kind of a monster. So I'm just going to give you ingredients to the proof, not the full proof. So you get some idea, and then you have to read it yourself. So uh, yeah, these lectures are by no means uh, an alternative to reading the book. It's uh, something to help you read the book. OK. So. The proof goes through a number of steps. So step one, uh, so first step is just to establish that it's an algebra of sets. So algebra has many meanings in mathematics here. It just means that it's closed under taking intersection, union, and the complements. So as long as we can do I mean, a sigma algebra, you're allowed to do this. But these two guys, you can do them infinitely, countably infinitely many times. Algebra, that's sigma algebra. Algebra is the same. You just that you take away the countable and allow it finitely many times. OK? So So that's the idea of the proof. First, you prove that it's an algebra, then you prove that it's a sigma algebra, and once you have that, you prove part B. So, uh, that's, yeah, that you get the measure. So, proving that it is an algebra, it is three operations we have to prove here that we can do a, a finite amount of time. So, let's start with just intersection. And instead of thinking of a, a finite sequence of sets, which already that become complicated in our heads, Let's just start with two. Okay, so we want to prove that if so, one <laughs> one step, not step one, but one ingredient here in this proof would be if B1 and B2 is in uh, this collection of sets, M U star, then One intersect B two is in M um, U star. So that's what we want to prove. What does that mean? We need to check that. Now comes this auxiliary set A that can be anything. Right. So remember. The test for checking if something is measurable is to see whether it splits up the set A, arbitrary set, in one component where you take the intersection, and another component where you do the section of A with a complement. And if you sum up the outer measure of those, you should get the outer measure of A. Um, so this is what we need to check. All right, it's really tiring to make so many errors. Um, this is, of course, something we want to check, but um, 
proof I had lying out doesn't work for that. We're going to work with the union. So okay, we're going to prove this now. If you have this statement, okay, how would you prove the intersection thing? Let's just then note that E1 intersection B2 is equal to B1 intersection B2 complement and complement. And when you do these kind of proofs, these identities for how set identities needs to come um, just naturally, right? This is why it's very important to do exercises. So what is, if I do a complement on an intersection, what's going to happen? I'm going to get B1 complement union B2 complement, then a complement outside here. Okay, how do we see this? Well, you just paint a picture. So this is B1, this is B2, then the intersection of B1 and B2 is this. So if I take the complement of that, it's everything outside this shaded zone, right? And if you do everything outside B1 and union that with everything outside B2, you're going to get you know, everything here, and then this piece is also B2, this piece is also B1, so you get everything except that piece in the middle. So these two are the same. Um, okay. So if we have that you can take unions, then taking complement, if you just look at the definition of what means to be mu measurable, you can always take complements. So if you can take complements and unions, then this computation here tells you that you're also allowed to take intersections. Okay, so now we're going to prove that we can take the intersection of two. Now we're going to prove that we can take the union of two sets, B1 and B2, without uh, leaving our collection here. So for that, what do we need to check? Well, here comes this arbitrary guy A again, which is anything. Yeah. So we want to show that the union of B1 and B2 kind of separates A or A in two nice pieces so that you have this addition formula. Again, since mu star is an outer measure, this inequality is always uh, there, which I argued just you know, some minutes back, uh, one hour in my time, and five minutes in your time. Um, so this we always have it. So what is going to be difficult to establish is the reverse one. Yeah. So these proofs are always going. If you want to prove that two things are equal, you never prove that they are equal. You prove that one is bigger than or equal to the other, and then you prove the reverse inequality, and then you're done. In ninety-five percent of the cases, that's how we go on about it. So we want to establish this, okay? And then the other thing is when I did this wrong previously, I painted right and I wrote wrong. So I guess it's often how it happens. Um, so this is a, a picture of what's going on up here. We have the set A and then you have B1 in red, B2 in green. So the union of B1 and B2 intersected with A is this what I have in yellow here. And that's, um, you know, the yellow piece here. And what's outside of that in A, it's a purple piece and it represents this guy here, right? So now what's, uh, what, what can we do here? So we want to establish that, well, we want to establish this inequality. So we start working with the right hand side because it's longer, so that's easier to, to massage into something simpler than to go the other way, start from simple and go to difficult. So we take this, and now what can we do with it? Well, the only information we have is that B1 and B2 are in are measurable, which means that we have this corresponding identity here, but for, only, for each one of them separately. So let me use that. So here is 
the right hand side is written up again. And now I'm using the fact that V1 is measurable to take this first piece and intersect with V1, and plus the same piece intersected with V1 complement. And then the last piece is the same. I didn't do anything with that. Uh, okay, this is kind of you know fumbling in the dark, but let's see if we're lucky here. So what is this first guy? Well, I have B1 and the union B2, but then I take an intersection with B1, so I'm just getting back to B1, right? So here is just A intersection B1. Here I have things in A which are in B1 or B2, but then they are not in B1 according to this guy. So it must be sets which are in B2, but not in B1. So we look at it here. There's B1, and then there's this whole piece, but it's not allowed to be in B1 according to this last guy. So we just have this piece over here. So this is A intersect B2 intersect B1 complement. And now we use again one of those computational rules like this one to split, well, we actually use that computational rule to split this one up. This is A intersect B1 complement intersect B2 complement. And sometimes parentheses here are important, but sometimes not. If you only have a bunch of intersections, it doesn't matter in which order you take them, right? So I just throw away the parentheses there. Now, here's where it gets funny. So here it's simplified. Here we still have uh, a three. But now look at this fellow B2 here and B2 complement there. And actually, these are the guys. They are the same in both cases. So I can write this. A intersect B1, C intersect B2. And then I put a parenthesis there, and I put a parenthesis here. And I see that, oh, I know that you know B2 is measurable, U star measurable. So then this one and this one combine according to the same identity. We have that this whole thing here is equal to mu star A intersect B1 complement. Okay. Well, but this piece here, this mu star A intersect B1. So now we have these two plus each other. And using a third time or again second time for B1, the, the definition of what it means to be measurable. Um, this is that as was to be established. Right, so now we have established that B1 and B2 are in, are measurable, then the union is measurable. Okay, that's what we established. From there, we want to go to finite unions, but the proof takes a bit of a different detour. So the next thing they want to establish, and they do it, by induction is an identity as follows. So if now B1 up to Bn are disjoint in this uh, unmeasurable, then we have again this you know, test guy for all A. We have an identity here which says mu star of A is equal to summing up, just like we do with measures. Uh, so you take intersection with each one, they are disjoint. That's why we have equality here. And then you have some sort of tail here, which looks a bit fun. This is mu star of A intersect with the finite intersection from one to N of the complements here. So this is intersection. There should be really a parenthesis here around the second um, intersection sign, but it doesn't fit on the blackboard. This, by the way, is what's called a boat hook. You use it, you know, if you're on a boat and you want to get to the pier, you can 
pull in things. You can also use it for pulling blackboards up and down. So, uh, as you know, Sweden is known for being a very high tech nation, and the math department is no exception to that. Um, anyway, where was I with my argument? Okay, so they do induction. I mean, even for n equals to two, this is not really uh, this what we just established, but uh, using what we just established and the induction on this, you can establish okay, this. So let's, as I said, I'm not going to go through all the details of the proofs. You have to read the proofs yourselves, but I'm going to try to highlight when you do something beautiful. So if we take this identity for granted, now what we want to do is we want to cross the limit from n finite to infinite. So then what would you do? You would throw a limit n goes to infinity here on the right hand side. But that doesn't really work because these guys are increasing as n gets bigger. And here, due to the intersection, the other side decreases. So then these two counteract, and you can't take a limit. So taking this and just writing it up one more time, we have what we have, right? Now, if instead of letting both ends simultaneously go to infinity, we just take this guy and put him to infinity, then for each fixed n, if you replace that with infinity, you get a smaller set. So you can do that at the price of getting an inequality here. Okay. And now the beautiful thing is like now this right hand, this last guy doesn't depend on n any longer. So now you can say, well, okay, if I take n goes to infinity here, I just have an increasing uh, sum. So since for every finite value of n, it's smaller than this, if I take the limit, it's still smaller. So then u star of a is also bigger than or equal to, I can put an infinite sign here. And that's how you kind of a two-step process get around this uh, initial problem I said. Now you use the fact, so from here on, what do we want to establish? We want to actually establish that these two are equal. Now we have an inequality here. It's also nice because right now we know that this is an outer measure. So instead of doing the infinite sum, this is bigger than or equal to if I do the infinite union. And if you think about it, you know, intersecting each A each BK with A, or just doing first the infinite union and then intersecting with the A outside, it's the same thing. So this thing is bigger than or equal to that. And now you see that, okay, infinite union of the BKs and infinite intersection of the BKC with the same philosophy as these formulas over here, just infinite instead of two, you realize that this is actually the complement of that. And then using the subadditivity of outer measures, you realize then that we have this. This is just condition two, uh, sorry, three, the third condition for outer measures um, applied with two sets because. This one and that one, the union is A. Okay, so now we have new star of A less than or equal to blah, blah, less than or equal to blah, 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 which is less than or equal to new star of A again. So they're all three the same. And what did we get any wiser from that? Well, not really. I mean, it's just an ingredient in a big proof that you have to sit down and kind of massage into your head. But I wanted to show, I think these uh, steps here are beautiful. And now we can kind of feel that uh, we're at the end of it. So, so we want to show that u star on, on, on the measurable sets acts as a measure, not on any set, but on the, you know, on, on m u star. What we want to be, prove is our sigma algebra. And you can kind of see that we're close to the end here because now if A, you know, A was any set, but if I let that be the infinite union of the B case, then I have mu star of an infinite union. 
is equal to the infinite sum. And here I just get each time BK. Here, uh, I get the void set, yeah? Because I have the infinite union and it's complement. So then at the end of the day, we're gonna see that for this set, we can stick it here for the infinite union, k go from one to infinity and get equality. And then here, I just have, instead of this, I get my dk. Yeah, and you throw away this one as well. So, um, yeah. What did we do today? Uh, this was a lot of work to get not very far. Um, so basically the proposition I've been, this massive one is um, 136 in the book. What did I not do before that proposition 132? I proved that Lebesgue outer measure is an outer measure. I didn't prove that it actually assigns to an interval its length. And even that is a non-trivial statement to establish. I'll leave that up to you to read. Uh, there are some auxiliary statements here that you should read. And then the end of this one, section one three, um, is the inclusion that Borel sets are Lebesgue sets. So now I mean, okay. New, if we have an outer measure mu star, I've proven today that Lebesgue outer measure is an outer measure. So then it gives rise to a sigma algebra by this theorem I just ended up uh, finished proved or proving. Or... So there exists something um, which is M lambda star, that's a sigma algebra. And there exists another sigma algebra, which is the Borel one. And the end of this chapter is to say that, well, if I have a set in here, it is also in here. Um, but of course, there are more interconnections here um, than just that. So since I am tired and probably you're tired, I'm going to call, call it a day here. And I'm going to continue then next time with uh, this inclusion. But also establish much more like, for example, that we do not have equality and many more interesting and yeah getting more into the details of these different sigma algebras and so on. So that's for next uh, class. Thank you for today. Over and out. <laughs>